It's a bird. It's a plane. It's a Disney signature dining restaurant on the boardwalk in Walt Disney World's Epcot Resort area. Oh, it's flying fish. Exactly. We're Heather and Brian with Seeking the Magical, and today we're going to review one of Walt Disney World's marquee seafood restaurants, Flying Fish. Disney World has a plethora of dining options, from carts to quick service locations, to character meals, to a full-on AAA Five Diamond restaurant. Unfortunately, there are dozens of dining establishments on property that honestly do not deserve your time or money. On the other hand, there are dozens of restaurants serving phenomenal food that you'll remember for years to come as a highlight of your Disney vacation. For us, Flying Fish is the latter, and it's a place we look forward to visiting again and again. As the name implies, the focus at Flying Fish is seafood, but they offer a small variety of options in each course for those that are disinterested in seafood, or, as is the case with me, allergic to it. Typically, restaurant reviews will provide a breakdown of what worked, what didn't, and an overall assessment of the restaurant, or, put a different way, the pros, cons, and takeaways from the meal. We'll certainly cover those things, but we prefer to insert a little bit of the Disney magic and theming into everything we do. Thus, we'll be reviewing the experience by talking about the heroes, villains, and the moral of the story. Stay tuned to find out what is what. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss future reviews as well as the best tips and tricks for your next Disney vacation. For now, enjoy catching all the flavors that Flying Fish has to offer. We're sure it will have you reeling with delight. First, let's dive into the heroes of the Flying Fish dining experience, starting with the modern, playful, artistic decor of the restaurant. I know there have been some complaints about the changes to it after it was remodeled in 2016, but we think it's a vast improvement. The gaudy gold giant seashell lights that were are now hundreds of delicate glass bubbles and a school of fish hanging from the ceiling in a wave. The exquisite glasswork, along with the deep blues, grays, and more subtle gold and silver accents, give guests the feel that they might be under the water and set the tone for an imaginative dining experience. While decor is important, it's not nearly as important as the food. Thankfully, there were several heroes on this front. For me, the perfect place to start is with arguably one of the best bites of food in all of Walt Disney World, the Kurabuda Pork Belly Appetizer for $13. This was amazing. If you've been following us thus far, you might have picked up on the fact that Heather's absolute favorite thing in Walt Disney World is the fairly new Lime Dole Whip. I know many of you agree with her that Dole Whip is king at Disney, whatever flavor you choose, but I'm no longer on board. This pork belly is superior. Really? I agree that the pork belly appetizer was phenomenal, but come on, it isn't Dole Whip. I've had Lime Dole Whip three times in one day, true story, and I could have happily had it more. Could you really have the pork belly three times in one day? Yes, definitely! 20 times! It's my Dole Whip. <laughs> oh no, please Disney, don't make Pork Belly Dole Whip. Yeah, that sounds kinda nasty. But this was the single best slab of pork I've ever had, and I'm longing for the day I can enjoy it again. The pork was perfectly rendered to give a tender texture without falling apart, and it was complemented by the accompaniments nicely. I absolutely love this plate, and I would say it's a must get, period. While admittedly not as amazing as the pork belly, I was floored by how much I loved the green circle chicken entree at Flying Fish. I don't typically order chicken at fine dining restaurants because I feel like it's more pedestrian and lacks the wow of steak, pork, game meats, or even a handmade pasta. Plus, I can make myself a pretty decent chicken dish for a much lower price at home, so it feels like a bit of a ripoff. This time though, I was in the mood to mix it up and I'm so happy I did. I was enticed by the description of the chicken with rainbow carrots, farro, and tomato coulis for $34. The dish was half of a chicken broken down into three cuts placed on top of the farro with carrots, kale, and cipollini onions, and the tomato coulis was decoratively swirled and dotted on the plate. I ignored the sauce to start, thinking of it as a decoration, and dug in. The farro was the best I've ever had, and the chicken was perfectly moist and flavorful. It honestly didn't need the sauce, but about halfway through when I realized I hadn't tried it yet, I added it to the mix and was so glad I did. It elevated the dish from delicious to change your dinner plans for the next night to come back and get it again level. It was that good. My first thought when I saw the sear on my sea bass entree, 
that was $57 was this chef knows what he's doing because it was cooked perfectly with a pristine cedar. The taste of the bass was highlighted while avoiding the fishy flavor that could often turn me away. I'm a little sensitive to that, but it wasn't a problem at all. The sea bass had a beautiful flaky texture that fell apart as I dug in, and I would go as far to say as this is the second best sea bass that I've ever had. The best being from the now closed Michelin starred Fleur de Lis in San Francisco. That concludes the heroes of our experience at Flying Fish. That is not to say that other things weren't good. They were. We've had consistently good service there, and we've enjoyed many other components, from the tasting of artisan cheeses appetizer to the cocoa breech dessert. However, while good, none of these things rose to the level of exceptional. They were not standout heroes for us. They were more like cute sidekicks. Like Flounder! Um, yeah, you know, the ones that you enjoy, but don't really make or break the story. So now we move on to the villains of Flying Fish. First, I loved how the sea bass was prepared and the innate flavor of the fish. Sadly, less could be said about the red wine reduction and the leeks served with the dish. The sauce was just too intense and could easily distract from the fish's delicate flavor rather than complement it. Furthermore, the leek fondue was a bit one note and could have used another ingredient to balance both the flavor and texture, especially since it was submerged in the reduction. Honestly, I would have loved to see them pair the sea bass with a tomato coulis from Heather's chicken entree this trip. I admittedly stole a dollop or two of her sauce, and it was a home run when paired with the bass. The other villain of the restaurant was the noise level near the open kitchen. I like the whole concept of open kitchens, and there are some restaurants where you would swear there's an invisible wall keeping cooking sounds out of the restaurant because they are so shockingly silent. Take California Grill, for example. Even when dining at the bar, one can barely hear a peep from the kitchen. It's a well-oiled and managed machine, and it's fun to watch. At Flying Fish, the kitchen is open to a portion of the dining room, but somewhat removed as well, yet it can be incredibly loud. Most recently, we were seated at a table in that section, and we could barely hear each other over the regular kitchen noise, let alone when two cooks started, um, we'll call it conversing in very loud tones. Thankfully, there were plenty of other tables open, so we asked to be reseated, and they happily obliged. The rest of the dining area stays at a more reasonable volume, but it would be nice for them to add additional booths to help absorb more of the ambient sounds. With four solid heroes plus a few good assists and only two villains, the moral of the story is that Flying Fish offers guests searching for the catch of the day or even seafood alternatives a memorable dining experience that we highly recommend. Flying Fish is known as a great seafood restaurant but it is really a great restaurant that can be enjoyed by seafood lovers and seafood avoiders alike. From start to finish, Flying Fish showcased excellent food in a unique and fun environment that we really enjoyed. I'm slightly embarrassed to admit that I've been craving the pork belly almost daily since I tried it, but it's true. Noteworthy items that stick with you and a beautiful dining environment make the cost of the meal worth it. Yes, it's pricey, and certainly includes the Disney markup but it's competitively priced for the area and the quality of what is served. Overall, we give Flying Fish a 9 out of 10 and place it among the very best places to enjoy a meal in Walt Disney World. We hope you prioritize trying Flying Fish on your next Disney trip and can't wait to hear all about it. If you've already been, we'd love to hear about your experiences in the comments. Please tell us and your fellow viewers about your heroes and villains so we can share in your story too. Also be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss future dining reviews and many more tips and tricks. Thanks again for watching and remember to hug your loved ones, cherish the memories, and always continue seeking the magical.